Good morning. How you doing? Everyone having a great con? All right. Well, my name's Andrew. I'm the rodent. One of the lead for the security people, so I just want to say thank you for everyone being on your best behavior and following our code of conduct and also just coming to the conference and having a good time with us. So uh, I'm also an amateur radio operator. I love all this kinds of stuff. These guys are my friends, so I'm here like really excited to be here. Um, but I did want to put it out there. We do have a couple amateur radio oper operators, uh, excuse me, repeaters, lots of operators here. Uh, we look forward to talking with you guys on the repeaters. We also have some stuff set up in the hardware village, doing some HF and some experimentation. Anything else? No, that's about it. So I did want to span the word out there that we do have some amateur radio stuff on, on site here that you can play with. Um, I also offer like free radio programming help and stuff because some of the stuff you need, the software, I've got like every cable under the, under the moon. So um, happy to help if you need help programming your radio or if you have any questions. We love talking talking shop. So thank you for coming to Hope, and I'll leave it to these gentlemen to give you this fine presentation. So have a great day. Test, test, test. Can everyone hear me all right? Good? All right. All right, well, hey, thanks to uh, everybody for uh, making it out today. Uh, Joe and myself will be doing a little bit of a back and forth type of presentation because uh, we're covering lots of interesting things around open source RF experimentation. So just to kind of set the stage for what we will and will not be covering, this is not going to be a super in-depth presentation. I don't want to see anyone falling asleep, so I promise you we'll keep it pretty light. Um, we're not going to try to convert you into the ham radio cult that uh, Andrew uh, talked about, so if that's not of interest, uh, that's not the goal of this. Uh, we're also not going to promote any gray areas as it relates to playing around with the radio. We want to keep this highly ethical and uh, above board. Uh, you're going to learn some interesting tips and tricks. Uh, we're going to explore quite a lot of different things uh, to help you better understand the RF world around you. And most importantly, we're going to be uh, highlighting how you blend software and hardware together as it relates to open source excitement. So a little bit, bit about myself. Uh, this is my first time at a HOPE conference. Uh, recently, I had an article published in 2600 on L-band satellite, so if anyone remembers that two issues ago, uh, that was me. Uh, Hackaday also seems to like picking up some of my articles uh, that I post on one of the uh, ham radio clubs uh, that I started called Hudson Valley Digital Network, so um, there's lots of great content there. I've uh, been playing around with radio stuff since uh, I was a little kid. Uh, played ham radio for a larger part of my entire life, which is strange that I'm almost going on 25 years in this hobby, uh, which most people in this hobby tend to be a lot older than me, so that's kind of interesting. I uh, spend a lot of my day job uh, focused on research and advisory, doing lots of cool stuff. I try not to, uh, to blur the lines between hobby and uh, everything else. And so that's a little bit about me. And again, uh, Joe and myself will be kind of flip-flopping between various points of the slides here today. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. So hi, I'm Joe, NE2Z. And you also might know me on ROCs as Baldrick. I've been doing amateur radio for longer than I care to admit, so probably by the time I got licensed, that's when I had to do CW. A um, little bit, been doing cybersecurity forever for as far as a career, and probably as an origin story as far as within wireless mesh I was involved with many years ago in that regard. So, and then first hope, I think it was hope six, uh, for the amateur radio activities was starting to get together around that time, and probably about maybe Hope 10, we started getting into having an amateur radio repeater at Hotel Pennsylvania, so there's been a lot of people over the years who've been involved in all the amateur radio activity around here, and just a shout out to all of them. So really looking forward to this with you, and thank you very much. Your next slide. Ah, <laughs> well, of course. So again, we're gonna talk about, you know, a couple, everything's pretty much open source, from open source hardware to open source software. And again, this is what really the community that's really been driving some of the innovations in amateur radio lately, and also in our radio as a whole. So we're gonna be bouncing back and forth between projects that are open source, purely open source hardware, as well as ones that are just open source, soft, uh, open source software initiative, and there's been a combination of things, a good synergy that's been uh, going on. 
All right, so uh, as uh, like Joe said, we're gonna bounce around. Uh, there's lots of interesting open source projects. Some are very focused just on hardware, others are on software, but there's a few that we highlight that actually look at, uh, at both at various levels. And so I'm not gonna kind of go through all the little bullets on here. Everyone could uh, kind of take a read here, but some of the things that we'll be uh, running through today, uh, maybe just with a quick show of hands. Anyone familiar with HackRF? All right, excellent. So we got uh, a lot of people there. Uh, how about M17? Is that something familiar to people? Cool. Uh, how about Ubitx? Any uh, ham radio people uh, playing that? Cool. A couple, not too many. Um, how about uh, a project I'm sure there's not many people that have ever heard of Has Violet, but good. We're hope, hope, hopefully uh, going to change that today. Uh, how about software like SDR Angel? Anyone familiar with that? Good. That'll be exciting. Uh, how about Open RTX? If you're M17, that might be familiar. A couple of people. Uh, SigPy and HasViolet, again, probably not familiar, but these are some things that Joe and I have worked on together, and so we'll share a little bit more about that. So before we talk about uh, HackerF and wh why is it one of the best and often imitated, uh, for those that are not familiar, uh, SDR, or Software Defined Radio, it's very, very different than traditional RF design. And so the block diagram here is if you were a kid in like the 1950s and you were building stuff, these were kind of the functional blocks that you have and it was very hardware focused. You know, once you kind of built it, that's what you were gonna expect. If you wanted to modify things, that meant that you had to do so with hardware, maybe swapping out some capacitors, resistors, changing tubes, uh, updating an IC, et cetera. So software defined radio is very different where within that architecture, you still have a lot of the same functional blocks like the RF front end, which is where you do some, uh, some pre-analysis of inbound or outbound signals, but the majority of everything is done in the software. So with one SDR radio, like the HackRF that we're gonna be chatting about for the next couple of minutes, um, everything that you could ever envision that you wanna do with radio, it's just basically that's where you kinda of spend some time uh, with your, uh, your software. So it's uh, quite different than traditional radio. And this has uh, you know, been around you know, for at least 10 plus years, but I think now it's kind of like a de facto of most people know what SDR is. So just to kind of do a quick comparison, HackRF, that was what I would say is probably what really was the first low cost transmit and receive capable software defined radio. Uh, many of you might have one of these or with the HackRF Porta Pack. Uh, Michael Osman uh, is like one of my heroes and so he's uh, done lots of cool things uh, for various hobbies. Uh, there's an open source version of this called uh, the HackRF Blue, which is uh, what I have a photo and uh, have one up today. So what is it? It's a semi-duplex software-defined low power transceiver, semi-duplex meaning you can transmit and receive not at the same time. Um, what you can do, pretty much anything that you want. Uh, in the case of the HackRF, the original, it'll go up to six gigahertz. The HackRF Blue, which is the open source, slightly lower cost version, I'm not gonna say it's worth anything over 1,000 megahertz, but again, there's lots of things that you can do within that bandwidth. And most importantly, again, it's the one, what I like to highlight because it was one of the first uh, low-cost uh, SDRs that did transmit and receive. So I think before people, if you're not familiar with SDR, you don't have a HackRF and you're thinking, okay, this sounds like an interesting thing to experiment. I don't wanna say go and spend like four or $500 on something or $200. Uh, you might want to uh, look at one of the less expensive receive-only uh, software-defined radios. There's what's called the RTL-SDR. Uh, it's a popular blog. Uh, they make their own. I would suggest picking one of those up. They're around $40. You can have a lot of fun. You can do lots of interesting things with that, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later. There's also a much smaller, similar feature set called the, uh, the Nuelec Nano. Uh, if anyone's looking for, like, covert monitoring, if you want to kind of spy on your neighbor's... Uh, Weather sensors or next time that you're transiting in an airport might be interesting to see some of the different signals that are floating around. I'm not gonna say that I've done that myself, but I have some experience with that. Um, there's also a, a device called a Lime SDR Mini, which is also a transmit receive capable device. It is full duplex, which is rather interesting. It's a lot smaller um, and they have a new version of this. And so this you might also wanna consider as another toy. Um, the benefit of getting also a receive-only device is if you have a HackRF and you want to receive the stuff that you may decide to transmit with, spending another $400 on an expensive HackRF might not be the best way to spend your money. 
go and get a cheap SDR to play with it. Again, there's lots of different things you can do. If anyone has like one of these little GLI um, pocket routers, you can connect an SDR to that and stream things over it. So rather than tie up your computer, you can do basic things there. Um, there's just, there's a lot. Um, so the HackerF, I think if you go and do a Google search, if you're not familiar with it, there's a lot that you're gonna find. And I like highlighting this because it is a, uh, an open source piece of hardware. Everything's documented on GitHub. There's lots of great material out there. So uh, definitely feel free to check that out. Now kind of jumping to something kind of totally different, but let's say for example, you have one of these HackerF devices and you're trying to think, well, what do you want to do with it? Uh, most of the signals that are floating around out there, excluding analog voice and other kind of telemetry things like APRS or packet or things like that, there's lots of digital signals and you'll just hear kind of, you know, brr and beep, 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 you know, just, you know, you don't know what those are by your ear. Um, many of those happen to be proprietary. If you want to experiment, if you're interested in amateur radio, there's a new um, mode called M17, and there's a couple people floating around here today that are uh, more tightly linked into that project than myself, but it's something that's really interesting, really innovative. It's been out for a few years, and this is one of these things that really kind of blurs the lines of what Joe and I are gonna talk about today as it relates to the combination of hardware and software from an open source perspective, and so, there are some open source designs for the M17 project that uh, Waj, his amateur radio call sign in Poland is SP5WWP. He's the guy who came up with this, so then he has a whole horde of followers that help him kind of try to figure out how to conquer the world. So it's something really interesting. I'd highly suggest people to take a look at it. Um, we're gonna do some experimentation uh, in the RF village here. So if you wanna learn a little bit more, feel free to stop by a little bit later today. Um, there's a lot of cool partnerships that M17 also has. At uh, bottom right, uh, there is a logo for the Amateur Radio Relay League. That's the leading advocate in the United States regarding amateur radio. And uh, my friend Ed, N2XDD, who's probably somewhere out there, uh, he recently received an award on behalf of the larger team. And so it's good to see that there's advocacy groups looking at open source and trying to figure out how to not only work with them, but also wider parts of like the hacker and maker and wider open source community. So um, that's a little bit about M17 and we'll talk about this uh, in context of some of the software that uh, Joe and I are gonna jump into. So with that, we're gonna go to something a little different that Joe's gonna talk to, similar software defined radio, but a totally different application and totally different spectrum. So Joe. So what's interesting as far as in the uh, kits have been coming out, as far as um, amateur radio transceivers, Ubidex is a popular project came out of India. For about $100, you could build a software-controlled transceiver. And the reason I'm saying software-controlled is because when you saw that earlier diagram that Steve provided with you where you see software defined for every element or processing signal, and some of these kits you're running into anymore, what they're doing is they're blending a lot of the analog and making sure that just the oscillators are actually being software controlled. So you might have an oscillator, typically from Adafruit, SI5351, all the oscillators are actually being controlled by Arduino, and the Arduino at the end of the day is actually going ahead and, going ahead and updating the displays accordingly. But um, this was pretty much probably the, one of the first transceivers to sort of break the ice, as it were, for sort of cheaper and cheaper transceivers are coming out. A lot of people have been buying these transceivers as far as playing around for, for digital modes in, in uh, amateur radio. And um, there's a couple of versions. It's up to version 6. Um, one of the original versions had uh, just LCDs, but the newer versions are actually bringing Nextian displays, and everything's all pretty much pre-programmed from um, from the person who distributes it. Again, you can find this uh, online from um, for looking for Ubidex, and you can order it. And as far as the kit, the assembly, there's very little soldering. All you're doing is soldering connectors that come off the uh, board itself. You're not, this board itself, as you see the kit here, it comes exactly as you see it. It's already pre-populated, in fact, the uh, case that they actually ship the basic kit in, you could probably use the plastic case as the uh, enclosure for it in itself. I got a, um, a video of, uh, this is one that I've actually assembled. This is the original version with the LCD. And uh, you're gonna get a little bit, I know Steve likes to get a little laughed at any time we turn on 80 meters and uh, an HF because it's uh, always very interesting conversations going on there. So let me see if this will come through.
Okay, well, the audio is not coming through on it, but that's okay. So, again, it's very simple. Oh, there you go. If you go up to 3.8 megahertz, you hear, tend to hear some very interesting conversations of sometimes political or whatever. But at the end of the day, this is for the LCD display is very simple, but the newer versions actually have a next gen display that uh, I'll actually show you in um, this, uh, when I get into a future slide here. But this is what that radio looks like opened up. Um, that vertical board you see there, that's the LD, LCD display and the Arduino. The Arduino's in that part. Actually, they call it a Raduino from um, the UBX folks because it comes already pre-programmed. And then that just literally just plugs right into that board there. So any of this soldering you see I had to do is really to the left-hand side of that um, left-hand side of that screen there for all the interface capabilities. And then you know, everything else on the front end is pretty much mostly connector parts. So, and give you a high level view to a lot of these kits anymore. If you look from the top down, again, you have the, the Nextian display itself, where actually it's a computer in itself to be programmed, and you actually have the rotary encoder, and that all goes down to the microcontroller itself. But you see from the microcontroller, from a software controlled, all it's doing is controlling the, oper the, the oscillators and the filters that it needs to select for the, um, for the proper bands. A lot of the rest of this is still analog in this kit. And again, you can see a lot of kits that way, and that's how they tend to keep the costs um, pretty much low in that regard. And then for the Nextian displays, what's great about them is um, there's a, the Windows application that Nextian has that you can go ahead and recreate and reprogram this display any way you want. So there's a lot of programmability and development you can. So you know there's, um, there's a site called hvdn.org, Hudson Valley Digital Network. Steve runs um, Hudson Valley Digital Network, and we actually post a number of articles on it. And if anyone's familiar with something called the ICOM 705, it's supposed to be a low-power QRP transceiver. I've been trying to come across a way of doing a, a poor man's, um, a poor man's uh, version of that. So that's about a bit, bit for you with X. Another project we were mentioning about before is we're talking about Hasviolet. So this again was another Hudson Valley Digital Network project. What we're trying to identify is um, between the maker, the hacker community, and amateur radio, identify a way of getting better people better uh, educated and communications and options are out there. So we came up with the project of Hasviolet, you know, the hardware, the antenna, and the software, that's where the Has part comes from. And this is actually using LoRa technology. In fact, we actually have, um, if you go to the link, we have all the information of putting this together from the hardware to the software. Um, pretty much we have a list of the kit from Adafruit, which, is tip, which really is this little thing right here. All it is is a Raspberry Pi Zero with a hat on it that's got the uh, LoRa RF module on it with a little miniature OLED display, a couple buttons. And all together, you know, depending on how much you can pay for Raspberry Pi Zero anymore, you can get them sort of like, you know, what they're supposed to be. You can go all this for maybe about, you know, 100 bucks or less, but you can actually get some pretty serious distance out of it. So that was part of the project we were trying to do for, for 900 megahertz. We were pretty much focusing mostly on digital. Um, again, we have a whole GitHub repo and everything that's up for that. And you can actually get some serious distance on Laura. So what I'm going to show to you next is a demonstration. What you're seeing a map here is this is uh, the uh, Hudson River Valley, just about 50 miles north where, you know, the area we live in. And we actually did some communication connectivity with these things across about, you know, a mile and a half of the river, and we're only doing, like, milliwatts. And we even had these on low power setting. So give you an I idea. Never mind, just give you the map. And we're going to for check for distance across the Hudson River to the left, Newburgh, New York, where I'm at, NE2Z. And across the river in the bottom, toward the bottom right in that park, is where Steve K2GOG and Joe and when JTA are at. I think that's the Pete Seeger Park, it's best known. Right now, that's where I'm tracking it from. I have both two machines, all two uh, Hasvile Pies are transmitting right now. One's NE2Z50, and the other is Purple 60. I think any 2 z 50 is the one that's using an Omni, and the purple is using the Hasviolet antenna. And again, show you what that looks like. You, know, you see that on a map. It's actually here, where we're looking across the Hudson. And they are approximately over in that general direction. And the pies themselves that are transmitting are right here. 
So you have right within with the has violet antenna itself, you got, um, I think I said before purple, and you got NE2Z. And doing as a ground plane with the Omni. Pretty much have that all set up. Just go into a regular power strip and some regular Pi power packs, 2.5 amp each, plugged into the power right there. There's a setup in the sunny Hudson River in the majestic Hudson Valley. Yeah, down that pass is West Point, so we got a, I got a direct line of sight to whoever's going on over there, so it's interesting. But anyhow, the antenna you heard me show, mention, that's a design by Steve, which um, Steve can comment a little bit, but it was actually a, you know, a, a pen and um, a couple of rods he's designed to make sure pretty much I had a good directional connectivity, but we had some really, we had solid connection back and forth. We had, uh, I was surprised, we just fired them up and connected right away, and we realized we were on the lowest power settings for these, uh, for the LoRa devices. And we actually went one step further rather than just doing the Pi Zero. We we're actually doing this on ESP32, also on the same repo, and again, some really good results. Um, what we've also been coming up with for these little devices is, if anyone of you knows in the amateur radio community, Fox Hunts, where you're looking for a hi uh, hiding, uh, looking for a hidden transmitter. So we actually put together a project we're referring to as HasDuck, where we actually make it that this is not just a dumb transmitter send something out. It actually, you can connect other sensors to it, and based upon its environment, if it knows it's being encroached upon, try to be a little bit devious about how it's sending signals out. So, so that's on the HasViolet project. So going back to you know one of the favorite. Uh, applications that Steve likes to work with is SDR Angel. We were getting down to the path of looking at what are some of the uh, distros out there that support software-defined radio. So when I look at across the landscape, one of the ones you'll see talked about a lot, especially for the RF hacking, RF village, especially for DEF CON, is Pentu. So if you ever go to the RF uh, village out in DEF CON and you're going to participate in any of the, the hacking uh, challenges, um, they give you tons of support if you're using the Pentu, which is built for just that. Another good um, distribution we've seen out there is a, uh, is a Dragon OS. And actually, if you go on YouTube, it produces a lot of videos on the use of that Dragon OS for um, doing a whole bunch of SDR routines and some of the latest modes. I, um, it's been the pretty much, you know, those two distros are pretty much leading what we've been, or we're seeing out there. And SigPi is a project we've put together um, we were looking at all the distros that were going out there for software-defined radio, and one thing we realized is they don't really stay really current on the latest packages such as SDR Angel. And we will find it that maybe they're a whole version behind, a couple versions behind. And again, we know SDR Angel releases um, updates pretty frequently, but we decided to try to go down the path of how we can go sort of some, somewhat package-based. So SigPi is designed to rise, uh, run on Raspberry Pi um, 3s and 4s, as well as um, running on Ubuntu as a whole, and it's all packaged based, and we encourage you to give it a try. We focus on signals intelligence first, and amateur radio pretty much second. And then what you'll see is build a pi is one of the more, in the amateur radio community, they have a lot of them that pretty much gravitated to that as far as trying to build your dish show to whatever you need for your amateur radio needs. And then when you go after open source, the next biggest thing tends to be there's a commercial thing called a rig pie, which includes the hardware. But when you look at the cost of a few hundred dollars for this rig pie box, hardware and software and everything else, you're like, there's a lot of markup and build up in it, but there's also a bunch of support. And I'm just mentioning it just for as a comparison of the next nearest thing you run into uh, potentially commercially. Steve. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're jumping around, you know, what we're trying to encourage is uh, anyone to come visit us in the RF Village along with all of our other ham radio cult type of uh, friends to learn about some of this latest and greatest stuff. It's really hard to focus on one of these topics. Um, you know, we could easily carry on 50 minutes on any of the things that we talk, talk about, but, you know, here, just kind of coming back to the software that Joe mentions, there's lots of different applications. When you get a software-defined radio, you need to have some software to run on it. 
Um, you know, there's lots of interesting applications that are command line based. Uh, there's one like uh, RTL 433, which is great at sensing uh, everything from your neighbor's uh, w uh, weather stations to uh, cars as they drive past and detecting their tire pressure monitoring systems. So there's lots of interesting command line applications, but what's unique with um, software defined, uh, or I should say SDR Angel, is if we look at a lot of the things that Joe and I talked about. So for example, with Joe, if we're looking at the Ubitix pr uh, project, there's ways that you can interface a cheap SDR on the receive end and output the signals from that into a program like this, and then you can visualize all the RF around you. So if you're looking for signals in a certain range, you can see that, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, if we looked at like the, uh, the HasViolet project that Joe and I worked on uh, sending uh, LoRaWAS signals, uh, inbuilt into SDR Angel, you can send and receive LoRaWAS signals, which is actually pretty neat. So if you do have a HackRF, you can not only receive, you could also transmit, uh, which is uh, quite unique. And then same thing on the RF distributions. As, uh, as Joe said, sometimes packages break. If anyone's played around with Linux long enough, you know you got to run different commands, or if one thing stops working, it blows up all sorts of other software and interdependencies. And so what we've tried to do is to circumnavigate a lot of that. And that's why we really like SDR Angel, because a lot of that annoyance is done for you in one application. So you could monitor traditional analog signals. You can receive uh, digital and analog television. You could receive aircraft transponders. There's like so many different things that you can do in this one application. And um, for how long that the developer, uh, Edward, has been uh, focusing on this, I've been starting to see a lot of what he's done is being carried over into other uh, software-defined applications like SDR++ and uh, SDR Uno and a few others. And so that's kind of like how we're tying back SDR Angel to what um, Joe talked about. And then for myself, which I kind of touched on a lot of this on the HackRF um, and M17. As of five days ago on the SDR Angel uh, Git repository, they're now officially supporting the M17 mode for transmit and receive. They only have it working under Linux, which is kind of annoying for those that are into Windows, but somebody tells me those in the audience here today uh, won't really find that too much of an annoyance, but uh, it's a very active project. It's by far one of the most updated ones. Probably every two, three weeks, there's a new revision that comes out and then a beta, and then another major development. And so that's why Joe and I looked at uh, the SigPy project to think, what's the easy way to kind of update that without having to break all sorts of other inter interdependencies? But again, if you're interested in software-defined radio, I highly suggest uh, SDR Angel. It's something that you definitely need in your toolbox to really get the most out of what you're doing, especially with a device like a HackRF. So here's a screenshot of a couple of the different windows in SDR Angel. Again, if anyone wants to kind of take a look and say, hey, can you show me how to do this in SDR Angel? Happy to kind of walk you through in the RF Village. Um, what I'm showing here in the center is one of their new features where you can do a uh, 3D model of the RF spectrum. So instead of just seeing like a, uh, like from the movie Contact where you have like a big spike in the middle of a, of a screen or if you're thinking of like a traditional oscilloscope, this not only you can uh, do that and look at waterfalls, but you could actually use your mouse and you could actually move around the RF spectrum so you could look at it in a three-dimensional way, which is actually really unique, especially if you're thinking about narrow bands or even very wide band signals. There's some really cool things that you can do there. So that's in the center. And then to the right, what makes SDR Angel different is when you want to, say, receive or transmit a different mode, so let's say if it's AM or sideband or Morse code or LoRa or ADSB or, you know, whatever, um, the way that they call this is you have to run a separate application for it. So you could actually, let's say, for example, if you wanted to monitor a specific frequency, you can monitor that frequency as different modes at the same time. Or let's say if you wanted to monitor multiple frequencies at the same time with different modes, you can do that with one radio. So for example, if we look at like a HackRF, this will give you a pass band of about 10 megahertz. So at any point, let's say FM broadcast bands, I could look at 10 megahertz of spectrum for the FM broadcast band at the same time, if I wanted to, I could run a separate wideband FM demodulator and I could listen to multiple radio stations at the same time. Is it really useful? Maybe, maybe not. But let's say if you wanted to monitor multiple uh, aircraft or multiple data signals within that passband of 10 megahertz or in some devices that go much higher, that's one of the unique things that you can do with uh, SDR Angel. None of the other software out there that I'm familiar with, which is most of them, allows you to do that. I would say that don't cheap out 
I know I've seen a bunch of like the $60 laptops floating around. Please do yourself a favor, use a real computer. Sometimes SDR can be a little bit compute intensive, so you're gonna get a bad experience if you're using like a budget computer. So if you are interested in SDR Angel, either I'd suggest take a look at the SigPy project because you can do a lot of that on a Raspberry Pi 4, and then you can use your cheapo $60 laptops, or if you have a really good machine, then you're gonna really extract a lot more data out of uh, playing around with a program like SDR Angel. And again, this is open source, so everything's super well documented. Again, it's a really great project, high documentation. You really understand what to do. It's not like a lot of uh, repos that we've probably all come across that sound great, and then it just leaves us to, to wonder what exactly is going on. So really a, a great project. Um, and then kind of uh, starting to close things up here, the OpenRTX project, which is sort of kind of related to M17, but it's unique in its own way. Uh, if anyone uh, remembers, at least eight years ago, there was a really cheap, inexpensive DMR radio that came to market by a company called, at the time they were called Titera. Um, that's what got a lot of people interested in DMR. It was a commercial standard that Motorola introduced. It became quasi uh, open standard through Etsy. And then cheap uh, Chinese manufacturers started to churn out radios. And now it allowed many people to get involved in digital voice uh, at the amateur radio level for a very, very cheap cost, oftentimes under $100. Today, you could even buy some DMR radios for as low as $30, which I'll have one at the, uh, at the RF Village if anyone wants to take a look at that. Um, but what, what, what OpenRTX does is not only on the project page does it talk about how to modify the firmware that would get loaded onto one of these radios, which is really what made the MD380 and TYT uh, radios very popular with uh, folks like um, Travis Goodspeed and uh, uh, Lady Ada over at Adafruit. You know, they kind of like really jumped on this and I think that helped really propel it. The next evolution is if you look at OpenRTX, not only does it kind of take a similar approach of modifying the firmware, but they also give you instructions on how to actually modify the physical hardware to allow it to send and receive M17 signals. So it's really one of these cool projects and it's, it's nice to see developers of a mode, which is open source M17, working with an open source version of firmware that would sit on a proprietary closed source piece of hardware, there's so much really interesting uh, future. And again, I think this does a really great job of talking about how to blur the lines between both um, hardware and software from an open source perspective. And then uh, we'll just kind of close things up just to summarize. We covered a lot. I think we've covered a lot of grounds. If anyone's heads are spinning, hopefully then that's the case, but come and uh, chat with us in the RF Village. Uh, covered a lot of ways that you can look at hardware and software together, so it's not one or the other these days. It's often a combination of both. Um, didn't really touch on it too deeply, but when you're playing around with different radio signals, especially if you have a software-defined radio that's capable of transmitting anywhere between zero to 6,000 megahertz, uh, do things ethically. Uh, you might be tempted to go open up your neighbor's Tesla gas store. Um, that's fun. You can look at all sorts of great little weird things. You can transmit uh, paging signals, but do so ethically. You know, we don't want to have some of these great toys that we like to experiment with uh, get on the radar of, uh, of people that uh, make policy and regulation and make it harder for us to kind of experiment with things. And that's one of the fun things with an amateur radio. As long as you have an amateur radio license, you can experiment on the frequencies and spectrum that we have. And there's over 23,000 megahertz of discontinuous spectrum. So it's not like 80 meters at 3.8 megahertz late at night, like the example that Joe showed on the Ubidex. If you want to experiment with a slightly lower than standard 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Amateur radio has set aside spectrum at 2.3 gigahertz. We also have 5.8, we have 10 gigahertz, 28 gigahertz, 144 megahertz, 220 megahertz. There's so much different spectrum, different frequencies do different things. And so I would highly encourage, even if somebody's not interested in talking on the radio, get your amateur radio license. There's lots to do just on data. And again, it helps you kind of stay safe. If you want to experiment, you can do so in a safe sandbox in the amateur radio spectrum. And again, what hopefully Joe and I encourage is try to do new things. RF is kind of a fun thing that you could experiment with. There's lots to do for everybody. Um, don't focus on just everything that's already been done. You know, look at some of the, the great work that some of these projects kind of talk about and maybe uh, one day you'll be up here giving a similar presentation on one of your latest projects. And so with that, 
I'll let Joe uh, handle any uh, Q&A. Everyone, thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, before I go into the QA, I just want to give you a gentle reminder. Like I said, we're going to be at the R Village, which is uh, cohabitating with the Hardware Hacking Village down on the third floor. We also have, we mentioned we have a repeater up and running right now, so anyone who have HTs with you, um, the use of frequencies and the settings. And as Andrew mentioned before, we should have uh, at least down, we have a trailer down uh, stairs uh, just outside around the corner where we actually have the repeater based out of that um, we've been uh, tr trying to uh, set some stuff up. So questions? Yes. No, it. No, no worries. Yeah, we might even have it ac accidentally backwards as far as reason receive and transmit compared to our usual up five down five. So. Yeah, the repeater's operational. I can help you get it configured. I had a question for you guys regarding SDRs. Could you give me a real quick rundown of what your opinions are between the Hack RF and the Blade RF? You familiar with that? Yeah, so, so HackRF, BleedRF, two kind of totally different beasts, two totally different price points. I'm not going to say one's better than the other. There's lots of specifications. You know, if we were all buying computers, we're probably comparing how much RAM or hard drives or speed or whatever. Most uh, SDRs, I would say, if you look at the specs, they're going to be pretty accurate. With the BleedRF, you're looking at a slightly higher cost point. The HackRF is a lot less expensive. But I wouldn't say really one's better than the other. The difference, though, however, with a hacker ref is it's a heck of a lot more portable compared to something like a blade ref. Or uh, to put this on your uh, Christmas wish list, the Lime SDR Mini 2.0, which recently came out, this is similar comparable functionality, but it's a lot less scary looking, especially if you're going through like an airport, because it just looks like a standard Wi Fi dongle. If you go through with like a blade ref, you know, you might get a couple more questions. It just looks like a regular dongle. So did well, it really, I, didn't really answer your question? No, I think that helped. And to amplify what you were saying before, my amateur radio license has helped me with the TSA and other agencies when I'm flying and traveling. Because they have questions about your equipment. You pull out your license and say, well, actually, I'm licensed by the federal government. You can go pound sand. So it usually works. But one final question between the two of you guys, what is your favorite modes and bands that you like to use? I'm gonna let Joe talk about that first so I can get the easy question. The question is what's favorite band? Bands and modes. Yeah, I'm, I'm more of a non-talker, so I like digital modes, um, and that scope CW in it, I'll keep, keep that fine, but you know, Steve's the one who's turned me on to the 17 meter band, right? And as far as going to 18.1 megahertz, and between antenna size, between low power and everything else, that's why I'm pretty much enjoying it. And also I've been finding digital modes on, uh, or FT8 modes on uh, six meters, which has been rather interesting. So that's gotten me, you know, go away from the fray of typically, you know, 40, you know, 40 meters at night to do some stuff. All right, and I guess just to follow on Joe, he kind of stole some of my thunder on things that I've kind of forced him into, like uh, amateur radio HF, there's the traditional bands 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. There's what's called the warp bands, which uh, were kind of set aside for different reasons. And so oftentimes, a lot of ham radio people kind of avoid these extra frequencies for no good reason, just because they just choose to not understand them or because it's too hard. There's nothing really different about it, but there's a lot of different and unique activity, especially on the 17 meter band, which is 18.1 megahertz plus and minus or so. Uh, six meters, which is 50 to 54 megahertz, when I was a kid, I loved six meters. My neighbors didn't because uh, TV channel f two? Yeah, I think it was either two or four. Uh, let's just say every time that I transmit on six meters, my neighbors were not a fan, especially when they were watching the news. And so a lot of people uh, tended to avoid six meters if they had cranky neighbors like me. Um, but otherwise, my uh, official answer is I enjoy things related to satellite communications. And so I'm going uh, using two meters and 70 centimeters, so that's 144 and 440 megahertz, similar to the band that the, uh, the repeater that we keep talking about uses. Um, but it also permits me to experiment at other frequencies like 10 gigahertz. And so I like pushing the envelope quite a bit. In terms of modes, um, I'll talk, but I also like doing data. I think if we kind of blow that past just, well, what else can you do aside from just send little text messages and Morse code and stuff like that? 
I like experimenting with sending video or images. And so there's a, a technology called slow scan television uh, where you can send images. Sounds kind of like a fax machine. You can send an image over a very narrow slice of spectrum. It takes about a minute or so to send a uh, fairly good quality image. That's analog. There's also a digital variant that I experiment with. And then I'll definitely be playing around with it today is uh, digital amateur TV. So similar uh, modes that you'd have for satellite. So like DVB S2 is an example. So if anyone has like direct TV or similar things like that, we could use similar technology to send that type of high quality H.264 standard video uh, using little SDRs like this. And so that's what I like to experiment with. All the, all the things that some people are scared of, but Eventually, I pull people like Joe into to some of this stuff, and so it's uh, it's fun. So thank you for that good question. Yes, yeah, Steve. Steve's a bit humble on the satellite, but I've seen Steve with a handheld radio, the arrow antenna, which is like maybe a hundred bucks, and then going to his cell phone, looking at the software for the satellite predictions, and like, oh yeah, he got it. There he goes, making the connection through ISS or Avio. So Steve, I tell you, it sounds satellite might sound intimidating, but it really isn't if you just pretty much keep keeping it simple. Where you, you know, you get the software that shows you where the satellites are. You get, yeah, you just a reasonable antenna to point it, and then the radio to actually hear it. So. Oh, and then I guess just to kind of jump on that, in SDR Angel, it does satellite predictions, so you could actually look at all that, and if you marry that in with the reception, basically it does it all in one uh, program, which is actually really cool. So. Uh, another plug for that that SDR Angel and no I don't get paid as a spokesperson for it I just really enjoy that software because it's uh, it's free so it's uh, it's open for everybody uh, any other questions otherwise thank you so much for the time uh, uh, yes do we have a mic yeah it's yeah. right in the back yeah. uh, can you bring them oh uh, uh, real quick while, he, while I'm handing this over um, what are you transmitting to the satellite so uh, we can transmit uh, either voice signals, uh, Morse code, uh, digital data, uh, pretty much anything. But basically, a lot of the amateur radio satellites function as a repeater. So basically, you send a signal up on the up, and then it bounces back down on another. And so the benefit when you have one of these low Earth orbit satellites uh, spinning overhead at 22,000 miles is with very modest equipment, your communications footprint changes from, let's say, a few miles to up to 1,000 miles because it's the satellite's 200 miles above. It's like a big spotlight looking down. And so within that footprint of the satellite, while it's overhead, you can communicate with anyone within that footprint. Uh, I have a slightly like off-topic question. Do you think we will ever see the same diversity of open, soft, open source software and hardware for communicating over like mobile networks as, as we see with the ham radio? Yeah, so if I understood the question, so thinking about mobile networks and their spectrum, a lot of the workflows that you'd have on these devices, if you wanted to basically make your own cell phone base station, you could actually experiment with this that way. Um, you could also do what's called a private network so if you wanted to experiment with spectrum that you're allowed to utilize that on, you can. If you wanted to receive uh, mobile network signals and try to decode them, you can. Some are easier than others. Most of them you can't because they're proprietary and encrypted. Mm -hmm. But you know that's one of the cool things with these. If I looked at like uh, HackerF, if you wanted to look at what channels are being used, if you thought about who are the technicians that are out there servicing this equipment, they're going to have really expensive equipment that does something similar. But if you wanted to see channels, you could visualize that all with you know these inexpensive pieces of software, which is uh, or hardware, I should say, which is kind of cool. Does that help answer the question? If yeah. I heard it right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just follow up to my question: Is there a specific satellite you're using for this? So there's a lot of different satellites. Uh, just in the past few days, there was a batch of 10 that were hand launched from the International Space Station. And some of those are sending a combination of various different signals. So that's super current. Right now, I'd probably say there's maybe 35 or 40 active amateur radio satellites, including some of the payload on the International Space Station that's active. So uh, there's quite a lot. I'd probably say. Um, 
there's going to be some type of an amateur radio satellite spinning overhead once every five or six minutes. So as long as you have the equipment to support it, uh, there's definitely something to, uh, to monitor. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't know about amateur radio is the emergency communication support that they provide. Um, this seems like a great way to bring in, bring data in and out of those areas when you set up emergency communications. Are you guys doing anything with that? So with devices like a hacker ref, they're very, very low power. They're not really designed probably to support something for like emergency communications. They're more of like an experimentation tool. But if we think about the functionality of SDR, there are devices that, to your point, are very, very uh, interesting as it relates to emergency communications because they're agile. If you wanted to have uh, a, a higher power transmit capable device to immediately program it to the mode or method of communications that you're looking for, then yes, this is uh, something that it would be great to start seeing at least from the amateur radio emergency communication side start to embrace a little bit more. That's a good question, thank you. Any questions? Again, thank you very much for your time. We hope you enjoyed uh, the session. Thank you. Thank you.